Hello and welcome to Dinish Guard, the Cities ABC Open Business Council series. We are here again for another fantastic uh, profile and interview. And today with someone that is changing the world digital economy and creating new solutions, both in the academic world, but as well on the business world and on the technology world, which is kind of three areas that at the moment are interrelated more than ever. So I welcome to our series, Professor Glenn Perry. Hello, Professor Glenn. So um, it's difficult to summarize the profile and the, and the achievements of Professor Glenn Perry because he's been doing fantastic, amazing things that touch, like I mentioned, both the digital economy um, as well as the academic world, the blockchain supply chain, but a lot of cutting edge solutions that have been used to look at how to optimize business, supply chains, and a lot of other solutions. So I'll just read and try to summarize uh, some of the achievements, but we're going to be talking about it in the interview. So Professor Glenn Perry is the professor of digital transformation, uh, is the head of the Department of Digital Economy, Entrepreneurship and Innovation, and the co-director of the DECID, that is a center for decentralized digital economy, and uh, which is part of the University of Surrey. He's a PhD with a huge background, academic and uh, um, diplomas in a lot of diplomas I could go for some time. Uh, he has as well the the mostly on the university roles on the University of Surrey, which is one of the, the leading universities in the UK. Um, the DEC that is probably the, the most high profile department that is the co-director, the Center for Decentralized, and as well responsible for business school impact champion, which is a, an area that I'm particularly important both for our cities ABC and Open Business Council platforms. Uh, his work is characterized by an approach of partnering with organizations to develop creative solutions to challenges. It's been as well looking at the way organizations can help with business models, uh, value capture, servitization, and supply chains. And he has managed research consortium with the autom automotive industry, aerospace, media, and construction industries, uh, among others. And of course, he has a huge uh, portfolio of publications in international journals and academics. And he's been uh, as well collaborating with a lot of uh, uh, different sectors like the healthcare, um, with projects like uh, um, the manufacturing system of MSS, just as an example, that provides the body, on the body manufacturing for therapeutics. And as well, a lot of other projects that touches um, IoT, computer, data, and storage for individuals. And I could go through all the different achievements. So um, it's a pleasure to have you here, Professor Glenn. Um, I will put out the bio, but uh, I'm really excited about this interview. <laughs> Thank you so much. So uh, I will go straight away. So to the point of, uh, so with a huge academic, but as well business background, I would like to see how this mix in your career and the background from your parents, from your education, from your curiosity, how this put all together, because it's, it's an interesting puzzle from the business to the academic and as well, uh, right now, more and more technological background, which is, I know that is not necessarily your background. How did it all come together? Um, well, I, I, I suppose I failed quite early on. Um, and that then makes you never want to do that again. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> since then, it's just really a lot of hard work, um, but also wanting to make a difference. And so a lot of my academic work, I always want to see some real world application. And I've been very fortunate in having a, a lot of great people who've mentored me, who I've worked with, and I've been able to see how, what they do and sort of try to follow in their footsteps in, in, in some way, shape or form. So uh, yeah, I, I sort of started off as a chemist. Um, so I have a chemistry background. My first degree was chemistry with business. So it's always been a meld of those two things. Uh, and then I, I worked through, I worked at British Steel, um, making paint. Uh, and that went really quite well. But I was, it was always, you know, applying chemistry to make something for a commercial product. Uh, and that, you know, that led to a sponsored PhD where I was doing the same sort of thing. I was making nano composites by that point, blending organics and ceramics on the nano scale. And again, sponsored and looking for the commercial development of that. Um, really enjoyed that, that side of things, but um, 
you know, when I graduated my PhD, I, I think I did what a lot of people at Cambridge do. And that's I ended up in the city as a consultant, which I loved. But you learn so much about business and uh, very quickly. Um, but I did miss academia. So I went, went off to Warwick and I worked for UK Lean Aerospace there. And we were applying again the thinking of the time, which was lean. I don't know if you know about lean engineering, but how you apply that to business. And, and just that transfer has always been part of what I did. And it led on to projects in construction, automotive. Uh, <clears throat> and that's when we started to see digital emerge. I worked with um, the record firm EMI. Uh, we'd seen this what we were calling um, servitization, which is the move from selling products to providing services. And we saw that happen in music as, as the physical product, the, the CD or the, or the record, was replaced by online streaming and they were losing millions and millions every year. And we were modeling it and, I, you know, working with great teams of people around, well, around Europe, a couple of Spanish colleagues, um, Baron Vendrell, who's now at Birmingham, Professor Oscar Bastinza, who's um, in Granada. And we were looking at the development of this market and showing how, how the physical product had become digital. And I found that fascinating that, <clears throat> that you know, this, this process was uh, happening and we just kept seeing it. Uh, and that really led me into this applied digital world. So from there, many other projects, really looking at the change in the fundamental business models as the digital technology moved forward. I mean, I suppose I'm showing my age because some people will probably imagine, well, music's always been digital. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but well. it, was quite, it was quite a new thing. You know, I remember Napster uh, and all these artists worrying about their income. And, you know, it, it's a real problem. And we've seen it with digital art, we've seen it with, with music, with film, and so books as well. And I've been looking at all of these spaces and, and at that transition and really trying to understand what's going on, where the money's going, seeing the growth of these companies and looking at solutions that, if you like, help maybe creators, help businesses and realise the value of the work that they do. So, you know, I obviously as an academic, I do have quite a strong fundamental academic perspective, which is I like to follow what I call the for good agenda. So, you know, we have blockchain for good. And this is trying to understand what good means. And good is contextual, good is perceptual. And we get really philosophical. I know we can we can get right right into the philosophy of what good means. But but from a sort of simple perspective, good is measured by value. So when we talk about what is value or valuable, we're really talking about people's values. And then we get into, well, that's how you measure good. And value might be money, but it might be, you know, I value the experience, I value friendship, I value truth, I value honesty. And therefore these things are seen as good. And how do we create that in a digital world? At most businesses, wherever they are, money is, is the proxy, but, you talk to entrepreneurs and they often have quite a strong mission, a, an agenda for good. And it's really tapping into understanding what's driving them. What are they trying to create? How it's good. And that I find that really interesting. That's what motivates me to do all these different projects. Amazing. And uh, so, so, well, I think uh, you have, uh, you are a global authority, definitely in, in block blockchain for good, but as well a lot of different areas. So before we go into this more technical and as well some of these uh, areas that are critical actually for our world. So coming back to your academic background, so you mentioned Cambridge, Warwick, and now of course University of Surrey. So can you tell us a bit of this background? Because I think sometimes people don't understand all the work that these universities are doing that is critical for the rest of the world economy. And for instance, if you look at the vaccination now during COVID-19 was possible mostly because of cooperation between a lot of research between departments of the universities. If you look at uh, even most of the blockchains right now, of course, blockchain is, is that the component of crypto and all the, the which is right now is crazy because uh, we are right now in February 2020 for the people listening to us in the future. And we reach $1 trillion of the valuation of Bitcoin, which was the first blockchain mainstream case, at least the, the blockchain protocol behind Bitcoin. But there's much more work that has been done within the universities that actually made all of this possible. Actually, most of the papers made this technology because it comes from encryption. It comes from a lot of different technologies. 
So from all this work with the universities and as well from your chemical background and as well that part, how do you see this bridge between the academia and the real economy? Because I think that particular interest and as well some, some things and mentions on the mention three of the leading universities in the UK, Cambridge, Warwick and Surrey. Um, well, universities, I, I, I think, are often the training grounds for, you know, many business, technical people. It, it's where you get your fundamental training. And also, I think universities are, are centres for networking, where you meet very technical specialist people. And, you know, throughout my, my academic career, um, you know, I, I've, I've been able to meet these people. It, it's, it, it's a place in life where it's, it's sort of a, a bubble in many ways, because everybody you meet is very clever. <laughs> so you get to meet these very sharp people. And it's a real privilege as an academic in that I get older, but my students stay the same age because, you know, every year I'm a year older, but the second years are still the same age. So you meet this constant flow of, of new ideas, new perspectives, new ways of seeing the world. Now that's a real privilege. And all the different universities I've been at, you know, I, I was at Bath, I was at University of West of England. Um, and each time you're exposed to these different groups of, of very smart people, so as, as an academic, you get that and you get to stay, if you like, young through others, uh, hearing these new ideas and the way people perceive the world. Uh, and that keeps your mind thinking about these new business models. Um, and working among colleagues, I mean, uh, I like uh, people work in different ways. Um, I like to work in a very open way. Um, a, a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Valerie Purchase said there are two sorts of people, those who work in abundance and those who work in scarcity. And I, I, I really held on to that. I mean, she's, she's over in Northern Ireland. Um, but she said, yeah, some, some people have one thought and they hold it close. And that's fine. And you can develop that thought and polish it. But other people, they, they share everything. And if you share everything, other people who have like mind share everything with you. And that's how I work. And that's kind of how I've managed to do so many different things. You know, I find something interesting and I just share all these ideas. And that sort of bring, it pays back to you because people share their ideas. And if you read someone like um, Gadama, I think it's Greg Gadama, he wrote Philosophical Hermeneutics, which is in his time, he was trying to understand biblical texts. But what he was trying to understand was truth. And he, he also wrote Truth and Method. It's a very deep book. But in trying to understand truth, what he says is we all approach the world with our prejudice, our prejudgment. And he doesn't mean that in a prejudicial way, but in terms of we prejudge a situation. You can't open a door without prejudging. If I turn the handle, I expect this thing to open. So you have an understanding, a mental model of the world. But how do we expand that? And he said, well, we, un we expand it through discourse. <clears throat> and that can be you engaging with an idea, reading a book, or actually talking to somebody else. And if you engage in other people's discourse, uh, you then expand your knowledge of horizons because you understand their prejudices, their prejudgments, you understand their mental models of the world, and that expands the way you think. And the more people you can you can meet who have these broader knowledge horizons than you, the more yours get to expand. And I think this is really where universities are, are great centers for collaboration because you often bring in a, a global mix of people with different understanding the world, very different experiences. And through exposure and discussions, you understand, OK, yeah, this is your worldview and you appreciate that and maybe you share yours back and you expand your understanding of the world and it, it both shrinks the world and expands your knowledge base and for me that's that's what a great university does it provides you with learning but an environment in which you can learn and we see that's you know the leading universities that's what they're very good at they, these sort of events and actually what you're doing yourself you know bringing 
knowledge together, having these conversations, having discourse that other people can tap into and learn and expand their knowledge horizons and find new truth, new knowledge in the world. And, and you know, that, that is valuable. And it's inherently good if you read uh, sort of Frank Kenner's work on moral ethics. You know, what is inherently good? Well, truth and knowledge are perceived to be inherently good. They're just good. And, you know, we can argue the, the truth in that statement itself. But for me, I, I, I'll buy that. I like knowledge. I like truth. Uh, and that I think is good. And that's what we tr seek to achieve. And it's valuable. Uh, what value we, we gain from that, you know, it might be helping others, it might be extending life, and we're seeing that through COVID, just the incredible work that came out to make those viruses so quickly. Um, and that's sort of, you see this, the, uh, the anti-vax movement, where they're saying, oh, you know, how did this happen so quickly? And you're like, it didn't happen quickly. There's decades of work to get to here, where this can happen. But it's like, you know, it's typical sort of iceberg stuff. People go, oh, you, you did that very quickly. You're like, yeah, but look at the, look at the backstory and, you know, the number of people and the collaboration and global effort and the way that we can now collaborate using digital technologies to meet people, to expand our knowledge horizons. You know, what, 12 months ago, maybe 14 months ago, I was using Zoom. But nobody else knew what a Zoom call was, or very few people. I mean, obviously you would, uh, being a technologist. But we lived in this little bubble where we're like, "Oh, you go to a conference now? I'm just going to Zoom." You know what's that? I go, "Well, it's a bit like Skype." <laughs> but most people think you're doing video calls. You're like, "Yeah, we do virtual conferences." But why do we do it? Because we can efficiently share knowledge and learn from each other. And you know, this shrinks the world even more. We can chat to people all over the world and. My team, you know, I, I work, I always try and work with the best people. I mean, who doesn't? You want to talk to the best people and, and using technology like this, your people can be anywhere. I mean, one of my guys um, was working down in, in Portsmouth and then he moved to Sheffield and we're, we're based in Guildford. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, he comes down when we really need a face to face, but I, I think he's a great guy. He really knows his stuff. He's a programmer, does AI machine learning, that sort of thing. He's bouncing around the place. Uh, and yet we can still work together because the technology allows. And that again allows this acceleration, innovation, entrepreneurship really to spread. Uh, and I, I guess, you know, many of your the people watching this might start to recognize this. No, completely. And I think this is the, the beauty of the world we have. I think, although, like you mentioned, we have um, a diversity of opportunities and tools, although we still have a huge complexity, because like you mentioned, we are privileged because we know how to use these tools and we are actually using it for good. And we try as well to expand our knowledge and the people around us. Uh, this brings us to the work you've been dealing uh, with digital transformation. And as well, the as co-director of Decade um, Department. So, digital transformation is the most important thing, and COVID just accelerated that for the world economy. But we still have a massive paradox: is that, uh, and I think for us, if you look at Professor Yuval uh, Noah Harari, which is another academic that I like to quote, is that if you look at the challenge, is that a huge part of the world is not digital. Um, um, it's still paper, it's still the biggest technology is paper. But the challenge we have is that at the same time, all the biggest money and chunks of transactions in the planet are right now operated and managed by the biggest digital players in the planet. Um, so th of course, this is very simplistic, just to put it that way, it's more complex than this. But I think my question to you is, um, as an expert in digital economy, and as well as a researcher, and as well as leading a department that is a world leading department on that area, or leading a research center on that area. My question is, how do you look at the, re the challenges that we have to accelerate the bridges between the real economy and the digital kind of twin economy? We've been talking about digital twins for cities, but in the end of the day, it's digital twins for us, for each of our own identity, because each of us has a complete data track record, 
that is right now controlled by most of these corporations. And, but even the governments don't have that data. Um, so, and, and then, then we have a lot of paradox and I'm complexifying the question, but deliberately because I, I know that you're going to be tackling in different ways, I'm sure, but is that in one end, let's say the transactions in finance, 90% are done in, in digital, but then the supply chain is all paper and all complex. Uh, that's why actually we created the platform Cities ABC and Open Business Council because I was working with governments and I understood that there was not even clear data about cities and much less about business. So I would like to understand from both the research, but as well the industry, how do you see this bridge, which is probably the biggest challenge on the history of mankind, because if you don't do this right, at the moment you're going to have robots and you're going to have all the AIs that you just touch uh, replacing humanity, <laughs> if humanity doesn't do this well. Um, but yeah, it's a, just want to touch more on the bridge between digital economy and the real economy. Okay, um, now I, I had a little project a few years back where I was asked to look at the UK and uh, could I measure the digital economy versus the real economy and I came to the conclusion that there is only one economy and it's the digital economy uh, or the economy <laughs> and the reason I came to that was my window cleaner has a website and is on Facebook and you can't make a phone call without using, you know, it's all voice over IP, it's glass. So the whole phone network in the UK is digital. All the switching is digital. So we have to try and think, well, what do we mean by the digital economy? Because it's all digital somewhere. Um, I think there are digital, Digitalization and digitization, which is, you know, some records are still on paper and maybe that's a good thing. Um, some records are being uh, digitized and some businesses are becoming digital. Um, and I think it's a degree of appropriateness that we really need to look at. And um, we won't get it right first time, but I think what we have to do is, is iterate and be prepared to, you know, with all business, we learn over time, we iterate that the problems I see are, if you remember, um, back in 2000, I had a project on ERP system implementation, when the millennium bug was the big story. And we were working with aerospace companies, um, myself and a, a, a guy who works with GE now, Paul Price, looked at ERP systems implementation and maintenance and how would we get through the millennium bug and there was an awful lot of work done to make sure systems didn't crash um, and what we were finding there was a lot of the system implementations okay there was the issues with dates and you know uh, certain digital components timing out and, and maybe going wrong on, on when they hit the sort of zero zero of, of the date but actually we started to unearth when people had implemented the system, they'd written a lot of assumptions in. And these had nothing to do necessarily with the Millennium problem, but there were things like lead times on products had been guessed and that had been buried in code. And one example, an aerospace company, they'd given a 12 month lead time on a product. And when I spoke to them, I said, yeah, it takes us 16 months to manufacture that. I said, but your system's got a 12 month lead time in the day. And they, they didn't know because it had been implemented, the person implementing it had left and then it had just been buried. Now for me, this is the problems that are gonna come with the digital economy, but they exist in the real economy. The assumptions that are buried in that leads to institutionalized processes, those are the big problems we're gonna have to sort out. And I mean, you, you will, you will have read a lot about it already. I expect the issues around training data for AI and whose data is training all this AI and is it inherently biased? Because if you train your AI on, um, you know, a, a generic population, all the prejudice and, and views of that population get sort of baked into the AI and that's not particularly healthy. So those, I think, are the problems going forward that the digital economy are going to have to sort out. Um, but I think the, the economy itself um, <clears throat> will be still always 
digital and if you like digitized transactions and non-digital at some point we're going to have to make a decision about privacy and for me that's a big question and um, we seem to have in our our move to digital really gone way beyond what would have been acceptable 30 years ago in terms of, of access and particularly government access to information on you to bank account records and um, you know where's privacy gone in all of this and how do we get it back gdpr in in the eu i think was a, an important step but there's still a great deal of abuse of personal data going on and um, i think people are perhaps revealing far too much um, information and we, we had some research on identity theft and you know that what you can just look online people are giving away information that they don't realize is actually really sensitive so maybe education on privacy maybe a change in mindset on privacy and personal data um, giving people back control uh, I think is particularly important and there was talk of the data economy and um, I don't know if you remember I think it was in The Economist where they had um, data is the new oil um, it's not a sentiment I agree with because with data its value is kind of in, in its flow in its use and when you use it you create more of it so when you use data you get metadata and you get you use this data but what did you use it for and what did you create from it so you know from a very simple example if i've got all my personal details and i'm buying insurance somebody takes my data runs an algorithm on it and maybe creates a risk profile for me to be insured say driving my car based on that data so that creates more data from that data so now my data blocks expanded but that's quite personal data and this is one of the reasons uh, we created the hub of all things I don't know if you saw that was one of our projects and we were looking at this bigger question of the data economy and who's really benefiting from it uh, and it's not necessarily the individual so the hub of all things created what we described as a personal data micro server or P, uh, PDS anyway whatever the acronym is PDAs we call them now, personal data accounts. Um, and what, what the idea there was, was we were looking at internet of things in particular and the sort of data that was being generated in the home. Uh, and I rigged up this, my, my house and a number of other houses with lots of IOT sensors. And we were looking at the sort of information and I can share a link to the paper we wrote um, if people are really interested in that. But, you know we, we put sensors on consumption so what was being consumed by the house because we you could say um you know this many tins of beans and things were being captured we looked at um bathroom space because that's very difficult because you're not allowed video cameras in there so we were using motion sensors we were using um humidity sensors light sensors water sensors and through all of this you could tell <clears throat> how often somebody showered how long they showered for how much water they used um, <clears throat> you could tell i had an internet of things enabled towel so it, it had a sensor on it so when you moved it touched it it triggered the sensor so i had the first internet of things towel for fans of hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy i knew where my towel was um, and i knew who was using it um, and that was great <clears throat> but what we found from that was firstly I found out people were using my towel and um, when I wasn't there and therefore that that resource was being used more than I thought it was and it, it, it was a consumption resource because towels you use them a certain amount and then you want to clean them but you need to know the use and IoT allows that and then consumption uh, depletion resources like shampoo we um, colleagues at um, Cambridge had made like a digital shelf and you could weigh you, you put your stuff on it and it gave you a, a weight difference so when you used it and you put it back it, it knew you'd used that much shampoo and how much was left and then you could predict when that bottle was going to run out so we could see consumption 
but this is really sort of showing you about my life. And when we start to correlate these data sets, so we could correlate, we had Fitbit data, so we could see that, oh, when this person goes running, they then shower, they shower for longer, they use more shampoo than they would if they hadn't just gone running, they use more soap than they would if they hadn't just gone running. So you're seeing not only, you know, if Tesco's, for instance, had your purchase data, that's all they know, but we could see when you use stuff, why you use stuff, how you use stuff, you know, that you use this in combination with that, and those two, if like shampoo and conditioners, weren't what people were expecting. With guys, uh, we were seeing people shaving in the shower. And, you know, obviously all guys talk about where they shave when they're in the pub. Hey, where do you shave? I mean, it's a conversation we don't have. And yet the IoT sensors are going, well, this, this person's shaving in the shower. They're not buying shower gel because they, they in the shower, shaving away. Well, that's a different use context and that sort of information that we were gleaning super interesting for you know fast moving consumer goods companies who are actually saying oh this this is the use and the context for my product in real time incredible visibility but massively invasive of privacy so the hub of all things streamed all that iot data into this account that you held so you hold your data in a, a, a personal data account. And actually the company with your permission can send an algorithm to your account and do work there. So it can interrogate your data in your personal data account. And then with your permission, maybe just release the result. So that, um, that then spawned a company called, uh, well, it was called uh, Hat Dex, and now it's called Dataswift.io uh, there they're raising, they've been going for five years or so. Uh, so that's, you know, if people are interested in that company. Um, we, we started that um, a, a while ago based on that idea and they've, they've built it out since then. But <clears throat> the idea that you hold your data and, and then you can sort of trade with it. So what I think, you know, an interesting use case that I explored early on was insurance where instead of me giving the insurance company all my data, they just send the algorithm to my PDA. It works the analysis and all that's sent back really is the risk profile. Even then we were looking at what's the absolute minimum. Well, actually I could just send a hash of the data that, you know, my, whatever I need to fill in, probably my age and something about maybe my house, if it's buildings insurance, I could just send a hash of that data and a payment from my wallet address. And that's all the insurance company really needs. We've paid you, here's a, a policy code, and this is the data upon which it's based. I don't need to hold the data. They're holding the data, you know, the, the individual holds the data. If there's a claim, I might ask to see that data to make sure there's no fraud. And if I try and change the data, well, I can't because it's hashed, it's all secured. So you can see the sort of business models that you can build on that sort of personal data account. So that's, that's how I see, you know, personal data and economy. That's some of the work I've done, but you know, that's just a tiny snippet. And that little bit sort of got me into um, blockchain because we were working on that personal data and privacy piece. And Irene, Professor Irene Ng from Warwick and who's also the CEO of DataSwift asked, what about an ICO? Because ICOs were big back then. Remember when they were a thing? Um, and I was like, what, what does that mean? So I was dispatched to go and learn about initial coin offerings and blockchains. And so I went and learned all about that because DataSwift doesn't have a, a blockchain in it. It's just a personal data account, much like you might have an email account. Um, so then I went and learned, learned all about the world of blockchain and you know, Bitcoin was something around something between 250 pounds and a thousand pounds. And even then I didn't understand, I still don't understand the value of Bitcoin, but that's a completely different. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's another podcast in itself. <laughs> no, fantastic. And I, I think it's really important. So I want to touch one thing in what you said about the digital economy and I completely subscribe, but the challenge I've been finding is that uh, like you mentioned everything right now is digital okay but it's more about who is getting out 
of the digital economy. The, the challenge right now is that we have, I think we can say digi the digital included and the digital excluded. Okay, and that's the part of the data and that's the part of the businesses because one of the things right now is that uh, um, I always like to look at parallels with, with narratives and metaphors. And if you look at narratives, especially in film, uh, you have the Blade Runner, you have uh, um, Star Wars, and you have Star Trek. So at the moment, definitely we go in the direction of Blade Runner because we have these mega corporations taking part of a huge part of the world economy. Um, and this is no longer science fiction is right now happening as we speak. Because for instance, just from a data perspective, and you are in the economy, you know better than me, but the numbers are really scary. Um, for instance, I just mentioned you touched Bitcoin, but Bitcoin, as we speak, reached $1 trillion valuation. And, and for instance, the world economy, the numbers is around 80 trillion, a bit less, but the world debt is around $300 trillion. So we have a lot of paradoxes right now that are getting more. But the point is that, for instance, if you look at all the major 50 economies in the world, I would say that with some exceptions, all of them have a debt bigger than their economies. But at the same time, if you look at the major corporations, like the top 20 corporations in the planet, from the Apples to the, the Facebooks, that are, most of them are worth close to a trillion dollars, at least some of them. And they have more cash flow than a lot of governments together. So we have, and as well, more data. So I want to, a bit more provocative, uh, how do you see this, especially from a perspective of digital economy and as well these bridges that we were talking about? Um, well, the big, the big companies issue, you know, uh, I mean, you're absolutely right. The, uh, the sci-fi is ahead of us here with you know blue sun and the delos corporation and and these you know sci-fi based ideas of these dominant monolithic firms and what when we study these firms we have to ask why they're doing it and you know if you take amazon um we, we did some research on them trying to understand their business model and what we saw was um, we were interested in books and we were looking at well, what <clears throat> what they've done is sort of inserted themselves between the, consume, the consumer and the provider. And owning that interface, they started to extract data. And if you have IP, so if you've got a, a book that's in copyright, then you can extract value from Amazon and you can say, well, you know what? we want this much margin and, and this is the amount of money we want out of it. But the moment stuff goes out of copyright, we saw that Amazon then pushed lots of options with taking the money. But in terms of their business model, what they were doing was they were revenue maximizing. And what, what that means for the consumer is, Amazon were looking at providing you with the best price and creating consumer surplus. That is in your head, you have a mental model for how much you want to spend. So maybe you want to spend 10 pound on a book and they provide you with six pounds. Now you've got four pounds surplus. Now in their original model, they just sold books and maybe you only wanted one book, but you also wanted some trainers for them to absorb that four pound surplus. They had to open up. And then they moved towards, you know, Robocop, I think it was, who had Omnicorp, the corporation that sold everything. But from a sort of business perspective, your business model, it makes sense to sell everything if you're doing it low price for the consumer, because any consumer surplus means when that person goes to spend again, they spend in your store. And this is, for me, why you, you end up with these, you know, big uh, sort of Alibaba, or, you know, sell you everything type organizations with data manipulation of Microsoft, Google, and they've also been able to dominate the market with an offer. Uh, so I don't think it's in the sci-fi, these organizations are always seen as somehow, you know, masterminded the evil. I, I don't really see that having sort of watched it develop. It's sort of, it's a business logic and it's been allowed to grow. And why is it being allowed to? It's, it's regulation just hasn't kept pace with it. Now we could regulate these organizations and, and smash them up, if you like, or break them into smaller units. 
Um, absolutely, that could happen. Um, I think throughout human history, we have seen large companies dominate. Um, and, you know, some of the, the old British companies have dominated global markets, tobacco companies, you know, there's only a small, small number of British American tobacco, Philip Morris, these, these were globally dominant firms, and we're seeing it with data. Maybe it needs regulation. <clears throat> um, maybe it will be innovation, because the innovation in this space is so fast. And uh, maybe they'll just get overtaken, we don't know, time will tell. Um, but quite how we address it, I think, will need, we're seeing that the fight going on at the moment in, in Australia with media, news media. Um, and maybe this sort of regulation will come in and unnecessarily break down these big, big businesses into smaller organisations. But recognising that in breaking them down, you might put the price of things up because you lose those scale economies, you lose the benefits of consumer surpluses. So we, we have to look at what do we want to do? Why do we want to do that? Uh, and beware of the, if you like, unintended consequences. Um, because there were a lot of uh, benefits in smaller, more sustainable, maybe local organizations, but they also come with drawbacks. So we have to be cognizant of the, the whole space and try and, and again, it's, it's why I like the for good agenda. How can we do this so that the outcome is good? And good might not mean money, you know, massive revenues. Good might mean work and health and employment and security. Those are the things we should focus on, not necessarily gross value add, which may not be the, the, the most beneficial measure here. I'm completely with you, and I think the 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 challenge is is how we're going to make this bridge. But as well, it's not so much about corporations; it's about how you educate the organizations. Like you mentioned, the regulators, the governments, there are or the SMEs that are all laying behind this digitalization process. And I want as well. So there's a couple of essays where you talk about this, but I think it's particularly interesting. You mentioned um, as well digitization and digitalization. Uh, I know that this is a very important concept to understand because the devil is on details and I think it's very important to speak about digital macro concepts, but let's look at the details. So could you just uh, the difference between these two concepts, because I think this is very important even to narrow the challenge with digital transformation and the challenge with the digital economy. Well, we, we talk about digitizing data. You know, you've got paper records, you make them digital so you can search them, but then you look at digitalization, the make changing the business model so it's fundamentally digital. Um, and I, for me, it's, it's what's more important is looking at what you're trying to achieve with your business model when you transform. So if you make something digital, how can you improve things? And again, you know, being of a, I started to sound old, aren't I? Being of a certain age, I remember the answer phone. And for me, the telephone answer machine that we used to have, I remember buying one, I've, I've kept one, and it's at home in my cupboard. Um, but it's a tape deck, basically, that plugs into the phone line. And, you know, you, you recorded it. Hi, this is Claire, I'm not here right now. <laughs> but leave your message after the beep. And then it goes beep, and the other tape starts playing and records your message. Brilliant. What a great device. I have my little digital answer phone. If you watch the Rockford Files, the start of his that that TV show, there was this big tape deck with the tape spinning and tie. It's Jim. Some people won't even know what that is, um, but that was a physical device, and almost overnight they just disappeared because the physical device was replaced by the phone service offering a digital service. So they servitized the product away. And that, that's extraordinary if you think about it. Something that has, was physically a product suddenly doesn't exist anymore because it's just a digital service. So digitalization destroyed a business model and now it's, you know, it's practically free, isn't it? Your, your phone company just throws it in there and you can pick your calls up wherever you like, save them, delete them, and it's all done in the cloud. Um, that sort of change in a business model 
is so fundamental and we keep seeing it and we saw it in music and we've seen some resurgence in in uh, vinyl um, and I think uh, and also tape cassettes but this for me is about positional goods and they are a, a product or artifact that has value because you can have it and somebody else can't because with the digital it's it's nearly always fully scalable so everybody can have that because I can reproduce it perfectly. Well, how do I create value in the artifact? Well, I can do it with vinyl, so I only press so many or tape. Um, how do I do it with digital? So that scarcity creates value. And, and this is where you know, we, we, we looked at digital art and how we give ownership. And, and again, you know, this takes us up to blockchain more recent ideas how um, blockchain technology allows you to ascribe ownership of an item and put it in in a list so that somebody can audit against that and go yeah that that belongs to them and therefore it has value because if you have a copy maybe it's not legitimate as a copy or maybe it's very difficult to copy because of its digital nature and it links to that and that that link makes this item what it is because you know with with some artifacts it's it's having a legitimate thing you know with we look at um trainers there were yeezy v, v uh, 350 boosts the um the lugas for instance worth about 500 pounds for a pair if you look on StockX. so people are trading trainers but they've got to be legitimate and there's not a lot of forgeries out there um and we see these indices, great companies like StockX who provide, you know, you send the trainers in and they check to make sure that, yeah, these are the real things before they post them on. So they've created this digital business, this whole stock index around trainers and sneakers and watches and all the other things that they sell. Um, but it's the scarcity of those items that pushes the, the value of them up. And how do you ensure that those items are as they should be? The digital space helps but it also makes it difficult when you've got a digital item because, you know, as with music, with it, Napster and things being shared and digital art, we have to somehow either limit or, or ascribe ownership. And that, that's where blockchain comes in. I think that's a useful application of it. No, completely. So that brings us to the blockchain in, and as well as one of the biggest foundational technologies of our, uh, well, present development. So I would like to, to touch a bit, so you are, um, you've been researching about blockchain and you touched how you went to blockchain, but you've been in particular working in blockchain and supply chain. That is now a critical element uh, for business worldwide and actually most of the organizations are trying to get in that direction. But there are still a substantial number of myths around the, first of all, what is decentralized ledger technologies, which is a very broader concept. And as well, what is centralized, what is not centralized. That's why there's as well the concept of blockchain for good. But first of all, before we go to that, um, can you guide us through the concept of blockchain and supply chain? And as well, some of the major studies that have been working and some case studies in the industry. Okay. Um, so blockchain is, I mean, there's a, we've got a video online that I, I can maybe share a link with that explains blockchain in all its depth. Professor Kolomos has, has done that. But for, for those who aren't familiar with it, I always just, just describe it as blockchain allows you to create a list of things and it's very difficult to change that list. So that's what it does. So it's a list that's difficult to change. Um, so what you can put in that list is transactions. So it's, it's used in Bitcoin to say, you know, somebody has so many Bitcoins and they give some of those to somebody else and that transaction is put in the blockchain. So it says now this person has this many, this person has this many, and that list builds up over time. And it's very difficult to change that list, very difficult to edit it. So it provides immutability, which means difficult to change. And that provides provenance, history, to show you can look back and go, yeah, there it all is. And you know, that's great for a sort of, you can have obviously public, private, all sorts of hybrid blockchains, but fundamentally that's what you're doing. You're writing this list, you can't go back and change it very easily. Um, so when it comes to supply chain, that can be useful because 
if you've got say very sensitive supply chains where you want to know all the transactions that are happening then you can put information into the blockchain to say well this 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 thing went from there to there went from there to there went from there and then you've got a history and you can audit against it you don't need this if you have a trusted third party so if you've got somebody you trust they can just have a database with it in but where you maybe have many different players who are a bit Ooh, do we really trust them then you can use this this technology and you say well here it is you can all look at it all the time and you can all all add to it maybe and you, you can create all sorts of variations on that um, <clears throat> so where is it useful in supply chains well you can put transaction data but you can also hash a document so if you have a certificate of you know origin to something you can say right well, um for instance I, I spoke to a company the other day mine spider who are doing some really interesting work on minerals and they were saying well they've got a multi-level blockchain but you can put certificates in one level ownership details of the minerals uh, and then you can also put who works in the mine? Where is the mine? How much are these people paid? So all that information can be held in documents and then you encrypt the document and generate a hash, which is you know a special number unique to that document. If that document changes, that hash no longer matches it. So you put the hash in the blockchain and somebody goes, well, show me the certificate for this, this particular mineral. Here it is, here's its origin. And then the individual can check that document against the blockchain and go, yeah, this is an, an original document. I trust the provenance, the history of that. And therefore I'm happy to buy this mineral knowing that, you know, there's maybe not been any slavery in that supply chain, any abuse, if you think about it, conflict diamonds, that sort of thing. So we were looking at this um, in supply chains and we looked at an um, Agridata, which is organic grain. I think that's based in Australia. So if people are buying organic status, they want to know, is this really organic? Because obviously grain, how do you track that? And what they were doing was looking at, you know, putting the details of the grain. I mean, you could, you could put in how much was harvested, the weather conditions, any fertilizer, all that sort of information can be stored. Then you can track that through the supply chain but if if somebody's bought a ton of that grain and they've made two tons of products you know there's a problem you, you can do simple mass balance to show that that's that's not true so they've got a great system they've been working on tech rock uh, we're developing a tracing system for, for baby food um, and they're looking in china because they'd had problems of contaminated baby food there <clears throat> this puts an rfid tag over the top of the lid and a qr code and you can scan that code and that'll bring up a picture of the tin maybe it'll say whether it's a real tin and if somebody tries to open the tin the rfid tags broken and you can see a complete history of where that tin's been so that gives you some some veracity that your product is is, is the right thing world wildlife fund transseeable we're tracking uh, catching fish uh, in the i think it was in the pacific um, but there's a problem with, you know, illegal catches and with uh, modern slavery on board some ships with people basically being taken to sea and not coming home for years on end. And, you know, the ships out at sea doing something called cross docking where one ship unloads to another that runs in and out of port. But this ship fishing ship stays out at sea for years. But if you put GPS tag trackers on the ships and you have a manifest of who's working on the ship, and then they log the catch as it comes in then all of those fish can then be documented and so when you buy them you've got a bit more provenance of, of the fish uh, and then we also looked at wine and we've got, got another wine case ongoing uh, with colleague Mike Brookbanks is looking at, at chain vine but that, that original one was looking at um, moving wine and they put an RFID tag in a cork they put a QR code on the bottle because fine wine is is massively um, pirated, you know, copied, and so with this you could scan your bottle and it would, you know, tell you yes that's good, no it's not, and if the corks pulled the the RFID D tag would break. So you know that was all of that data again stored in a blockchain. So that that was one example, and the, the one Mike's looking at is moving wine from Australia to the UK. Particularly interested in 
recording all the information so that it can flow through um, borders. So you need, with Brexit, particularly challenging now, you need, you need different information, you need different certification. And then moving wine from Australia to the UK, and you can do it by bottle or you can do it by bladder. So a bladder is a, a big container with lots of wine and you bottle it here, or you move individual bottles. In either case, you need to track that and make sure it's not been tampered with so that when the, the, the receiving company here gets that, they know, yeah, my wine is safe. It's been treated well. The temperatures and things haven't fluctuated. It's moved through these borders and, you know, I can bring it in. Obviously, there's there's um, tax questions around this and all of that information. If you put it into this sort of blockchain type solution, then there's more trust and maybe trust can be developed more quickly with border agencies allowing you to move products more towards frictionless trade, which is obviously going to be a question for, I think, for Brexit. And this sort of blockchain solution might really help us to provide, you know, you could just look at it and say, yeah, this is, this is a, an unchangeable list. We can trust this product. So, you know, I think blockchain has really great applications. We've got a lot of stuff to figure out. Um, particularly around the digital physical interface. But those are some of the examples we've been working on. Yeah, that's great examples. Uh, so that brings us to uh, the question of blockchain for good. And actually we could put it tech for good or tech AI for good, a lot of different things. But let, let's focus on blockchain for good. And I think especially because like we mentioned, there's a lot of myths still around blockchain. But blockchain, let's say, if you, and I think very small people speak about this because at the moment people are still very, blurred uh, about what is blockchain first of all and the people even that know about blockchain even people that supposedly need to know more are still confusing on the crypto part of blockchain and the non-crypto and at the same time then the ones in blockchain there's a lot of myths between centralized blockchain decentralized blockchain or hybrid systems but well blockchain for good let's put it in one way if it can go very bad if we get a, uh, some systems that are centralized. So I would just would like to touch that and, and your research around these topics. Um, well, we were <clears throat> watching what was happening, you know, as, as academics and looking at all the claims being made. And, you know, I, I, I do tend to come at things somewhat skeptically. Um, and I kept reading those early documents that, you know, blockchain to, to end world hunger blockchain to you know help refugees and save them but if you if you use my what is blockchain blockchain is a list that's difficult to change so when everyone says blockchain I always mentally say you know a list that's difficult to change to end world hunger no <laughs> it's 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 part of a system what is your system trying to achieve and what small part of that system will be using blockchain and why? So again, it comes back to this, this idea that it's a list that's difficult to change and we should only put, you know, the transaction rate of blockchain is not good. It's, you know, visas, you know, thousands a second, the blockchain just can't do that. So what are we putting in there? What's the minimal viable amount of data we put in a blockchain? And why do we put it there? So when we look at for good, so ID, somebody, somebody had the great idea once of, if we put um, individuals' data into a blockchain, then we're able to identify them when they move country. And uh, you've got to really question that. You're like, well, why does an individual want to shed their identity? It's probably because they're being persecuted and the moment you put it into an immutable ledger something that ties the person to the id you actually if you know if a regime who is unpleasant gets hold of that you've this is not blockchain for good you've created a real problem so we mustn't do that and uh, you know talking to people who work in aid companies um, and really understanding the, the, you know, the unpleasantness of some people's lives and, and quite how sad, sad that it gets, you know, um, talking to somebody who, who said that he talked about the paper economy, that some aid agencies would go into a village and go and ask everybody what resources they had. So they'd list resources of villages and then they'd say, right, these are the different villages. This is the resources they have. 
we have this much money to maybe provide food or water. Which village of all these villages who all need it, needs it the most? And I was like, well, that's an appalling thing to have to do. And they said, yeah, and also we have to be careful with that record because there are invariably warring factions. And if they get that data on who's got what resources and where are they, that just makes them a target because that means let's go and attack that village. And I was like, oh, that's terrible. And <clears throat> so you have to be really careful when collecting data and really consider what is good in your space and how do you create value in a safe way? And you know, really understanding and, and seeing the world from their point of view, going back to what is good, how do we expand our knowledge horizons so we understand the challenge on the ground and why it's happening? So the blockchain for good agenda has some real benefits. And um, you know, I've spoken about the, you know, you providing visibility into supply chains. Um, and we're looking at the moment at chocolate and how we can trace, because chocolate supply chain, it starts off with very big companies, but when you go down to it, you know, you're, you're looking at maybe uh, is it 80 or 800,000 farms in Ghana and Ivory Coast and <clears throat> talking to people who've been on the ground there saying, well, the idea of borders in some of these places are interesting. They're drawn on a map, but you know, you've got people who roam and they don't know what the border is, nor do they care. Um, it's just a line on a map and they move goods and people get trafficked as well. And people get caught on farms and Unfortunately, the, the way of certification is not strong. So some farms may get certified as good, but then what, what we hear about is, well, this farm takes on a contract to provide so much product and they can't meet it, or maybe they have a bad yield. So they buy it off another farm and it all gets amalgamated and taken forward. And we see, uh, we see that happening um, in lots of different places, um, in lots of different industries, you know, in timber, in cotton, in uh, cocoa, in sugar. Um, it's, it does seem that there's problems in all these supply chains because of this issue where we don't have the visibility, we don't have the traceability. And it's very difficult for firms to trace it back because they might register with an organization and say right you're going to certify but then often again we've heard that the certifying organizations now there's a lot of them and they're effectively competing for business against each other so it's almost like there's a market at this bottom end and the moment they start competing on price then you know corners are cut maybe maybe not but how many can they really certify and still charge an earth price. Are they really going around all the farms? And I was talking to a, a, a chap, Brian, who runs um, slavefreetrade.org. And he was, uh, he's been around these places and he said, it's appalling. And you know, you'll visit a farm and maybe they had somebody visit three years ago and there's abuse on these farms and yet they're cert certified. So there's a great deal more work to be done here but maybe blockchain can help in these cases because we can, we can provide visibility. If you put in the blockchain, this farm certified them, and maybe here's some pictures, here's who works there, that sort of detail, but it's dated. So then, you know, you could push that through into regulation to say, well, this, is, this better be updated every year, every six months or whatever is appropriate. And then we can get visibility into that supply chain. And that's where blockchain can help. <clears throat> and the other thing we're, we're pushing towards now in, in the, the chocolate case is using biological markers. Um, because part of the, the big challenge in, in supply chain is, is this digital physical link, you know, grain and things. How do you know if you've got a silo full of grain and you put a, a barcode on the side, somebody can swap the barcode. It's, it's the weakness in the system. But working with, with um, Pedro Lafarga at UWE and, and Mike Rogerson from Bath Universities, 
we're looking at biological markers where you extract DNA and you create a meta barcode, which is based on the DNA of, in this case, cocoa, the, the, uh, the bean that makes chocolate. And that is unique to the tree, to the, the little group of trees that it's from, and it survives the processing of the chocolate. So we can say, right, that chocolate bar contains 90% of beans from that tree in this region. So we know exactly where it came from. And you can then put that sort of information into a blockchain and say, right, you're claiming it's made here. That's where it's made. And we can, we can register that bean against that bar via our trusted source, our third party of provenance, using you know, DNA, blockchain technology, and it creates this system of audit that um, protects people, protects supply chains, you know, in many ways protects the big firms because they, you know, I, I, I believe that most of these firms really want to have clean supply chains, but it's, it's difficult to do. Governments need to step in and regulate. Uh, this has been going on far too long. So, you know, I don't give firms or government a, a clean bill of health here. I think it's been very, very poor uh, in providing this sort of, structural support for supply chain visibility and um, get on a bit of a hobby horse about it but you know i think that is good that is a good application of blockchain but you can see it's a small part of a bigger system no and it's really a fantastic example so i think you illustrated fantastically and as well very practical because i think the challenge right now is to get into this. so i'm cautious that we passed one hour and a half um so we're going probably to wrap up with the last question but i want definitely to go to a second one <laughs> and i think they will be the principle of a lot of other eventual collaborations so um I think it... <laughs> <laughs> no but well there's so much different things that i definitely i'm i'm very excited here but uh, i i want to just uh, so you touched in the beginning of this conversation the process of for instance, you mentioned the digital uh, creative industries like music and for instance, music is, and comes back to my thesis of this kind of uh, challenge that we have with blockchain for good, with technology for good, is that at the moment, the music industry, uh, Spotify has 40% of the global market. And Apple is probably <laughs> the rest. So we have a big challenge that these platforms, digital platforms are already controlling a huge part um, of the big chunks of the world economy. But at the same time, there's a lot of innovation. You have, for instance, background in digital arts. There's NFTs, that is non-fungal tokens, which is a new area of creating new ways of creating revenue streams for artists. And it's really a fast growing explosive area. But I would like to touch, how do you see this specific area, especially in the work that you're doing with Decad, because you've been always bridging specific projects, like you mentioned, with the reality research, and business, which is fantastic, because that's the way to go. But from this, ba because normally the, like you mentioned, um, the music industry was probably the most disruptive. I remember that I actually did an album with David Bowie, which was my biggest achievement, and I put all my economies in the beginning of the music industry, and suddenly the album was available <laughs> on Napster. This was exactly in the early days, and I was okay. I'm not going to make any business with <laughs> this album, but uh, it was more visible. And I started seeing, okay, you just have to enjoy the wave. But I know that this has been very damaging because, uh, let's say, even the NFTs, which is right now fast growing, very few artists know how to do this, and very few people still know how to use these tools. And I think that's the biggest challenge to wrap up with the digital economy at large is how we get this to really empower people and that comes with the blockchain for good, but as well to create better stuff. So it's a big question, but it's the last one just to wrap up. That's and fine. I think we, yeah. Uh, so Decade, our center, this does give me a great opportunity to talk about the work we're going yes, to exactly. do. Exactly, yes. So I appreciate that. Um, so we've got three main themes. The first one is co-creating value. And you know, from an academic and a, a personal perspective, it's how I work. Value is always co-created. And we work with others, we share resources, and together we co-create value. Um, so we're looking at, uh, you know, in, in that case, uh, our, our first example is in the creative for a decade. Our first if you like, area is going to be in creative industries. Our, our three themes are co-creating value, data and identity, and decentralizing work. So these three things are core to everything we're going to do because we've got to work with others to co-create value. We're looking at data, but 
whenever we look at any questions of, of data, we always go back to establishing identity and that's who owns what. So you must identify artifacts and people and link them together. So value flows appropriately. And then really we're decentralizing work because these economies move the way work is done. And uh, you know, some work becomes AI. It means artists can work wherever. All, all of these interesting questions come up. So <clears throat> we've done work um, looking at media and you know I've spoken a little bit about um, looking at um, the move from physical to digital music and <clears throat> what we're looking at in in the first phase of our work in decade is creative industries particularly we're looking at images but you know it can just be a file and we're looking at content provenance so the truth engine and some of the work is looking at video some of, of it is looking at um, photographs but actually, <clears throat> pictures can can be shared. But if they've just been flipped or scaled, then it's not really changed. But if, if somebody doctored it, changed it, you know, put something in the background that wasn't originally there, then you've got another problem because this is where you move into maybe fake news agendas. And we've moved away from truth. You know, this is no longer true and that's not good, you know. So... <clears throat> How can we fingerprint? And we've got technologies that are being developed to audit truth. And we're looking at systems that, can we identify real photos and link who owns them um, very quickly and hopefully at some point in real time. And then if we're filming something or taking photographs, we can then look towards what we call sort of second stage next generation content production, whereby um, you know, we've got truth and rights management established, then we can say, well, if you go to a concert and say you're, you've gone to, I don't know, Glastonbury or one of the big events and you see the audience now and everyone's got their phone, <laughs> holding up their phone and they're recording. And I look at it, I think, yeah, the individual recording is probably breaching copyright because you're not allowed to record but maybe we could put a truth check app or something on the phone so you can record it. But after you've recorded it, it says, look, you can keep that, but you have to pay a small amount to the creator. And so you've got your own recording and it's unique to you, but maybe you pay something back to the, you know, the artist you've just recorded. So that would, you know, bring back, some money to you know make some equity value is co-created but there's another thing that might happen is if i'm trying to cover glastonbury as a, a a broadcaster i've got a limited number of cameras and yet i've got maybe sixty thousand people screaming 4k with their phone That's true. if you've got that app on your phone you're recording it and maybe paying but maybe if I ask, can I buy that recording from you? Value is co-created. You say, well, you can keep it for free. Or maybe if I use it in my live broadcast, I'll pay you. So now I'm creating this world of, of experience where we, we're really co-creating value. And, and, you know, much like the, the NFT type um, <clears throat> payments back to the creator. Each one of these transactions might make another payment to the artist who's, whose work we're filming, but we could do that. We've got this really interesting space and then we could offer new experiences because, you know, maybe you can't make that event. But if I've got 60,000 people with phones filming and they all activated and I bring them in my network, then I can do some really interesting trades and build experiences. And that's the sort of systems that we, we hope to do having micro brokerage so that if you wanted to upload it onto Facebook, you know, <clears throat> you, you might have experienced it yourself. You try and put something up and it blocks it because there's something copyright maybe in the image or in the soundtrack. You think I'll pay, but at the moment that option's not there. But again, we can see with blockchain having some form of decentralized organization, brokeraging micro payments, I'll just make the payment. I'll make my small payment so that this can be live. 
So that's the sort of exciting digital economy that maybe we can move towards. And then we can move, we're also then looking at, well, we decentralizing work, really. What else can we do? <clears throat> well, if we look at what, what I describe as high value jobs, like say nursing, where nurses might work at a number of different hospitals, but they have to keep a record to keep their you know, licensing and pilots as well have to keep a record. Well, they might work for different agencies. If you have a centralized blockchain record that's trusted and these agencies have permission to load it, then anyone can check it, but only a small number of trusted people can look, can you know, write to it. And then I have my list that's difficult to change, which is my provenance of my work. And that co-creates because it makes me more valuable as a nurse or as a pilot or, you know, if I work in the nuclear industry as a, a qualified nuclear technician, all of that builds my credibility. And again, this is this is decade. <clears throat> and, and so the final thing we're looking at is maybe commodifying personal data. So as well as just the the things we see, maybe the things we experience, maybe we can use these transaction platforms to to build and sell on that. So as an example, you check into a hotel and at the moment you might get that little card that you fill out at check-in or check out, you know, I, I did this, I did that, I had a great time. Who really fills out surveys? You know, bored people and angry people. And bored people and the angry people fill the survey out and they shape the world. That's awful. Our world is shaped by bored people and angry people who are doing surveys. The rest of us don't do it. And but if we have blockchain that's capturing data and you're prepared to give that, well, maybe the hotel example, maybe they give you a discount on your stay. They're like, oh, you can you can stay in this hotel, but if you're prepared to share some IoT data and maybe we'll we'll let you see what that is, or maybe you use hubbable things, data swift type data repository, we can mine it and it can be distributed, but we just want the metadata the what do individuals enjoy and how can we make our experience better not on a survey not on a what we think but going back to that you know that iot example i spoke about earlier which shows the the combinations of things you do oh you know you like to go to the pool and immediately after the pool you like to eat and then you shower and then you go to the cinema and you this is what most people like so let's set our hotel up for this but so many businesses with that sort of data insight could offer really better experiences. But we've got to do that with respect to privacy. We've got to do that with respect to the individual, with truth, so we don't get fake news or things going in there. And, you know, this is why I think blockchain, digital economy, and things like the, the decentralized agenda is really exciting because for me, that's where the future of business for good is. And there's so many exciting business models that, that hopefully will emerge from this space. Well, I think you put it in a fantastic uh, way of concluding this amazing conversation. So definitely I will want to potentially have a second follow up. And I think for people listening to us, we'll search and we'll get it there. But I think uh, I want to thank you for this uh, fantastic journey and as well the capacity to synthesize, but as well in a very um, practical and as well inspiring way because I think like you mentioned this part and the work you're doing with Decad that is uh, behind you in the image the center for decentralized digital economy and I think this is the kind of organizations that can make a massive uh, leapfrog in the world economy and as well to make things this happen because what you just mentioned all these different players working together can create new trillion dollars business and I think this is where people sometimes are not looking at the solutions but more looking at the problems or at sometimes just ignoring, which is worse. And I think especially people listening to us, I don't think they are ignoring, they're taking this serious. Um, and I think we're going to put the links to your YouTube channel. So it's amazing YouTube channel. There's a massive amount of videos and interviews there. So it's, um, I think for people listening to us, just search for Glenn Perry uh, YouTube channel. There's as well a huge amount of videos and respect and research uh, in terms of different areas and, and uh, different things. We're going to put links to all the, the papers and, and the research centers that Professor uh, Glenn is involved. I want to thank you for all this time and uh, definitely there will be the first of a lot of more. Thank you so much, Professor Glenn. Thank you very much. I, I hope people found it interesting. And, you know, if anyone wants to get in touch and have conversations, like I said, I work in complete openness. My, if you like, my metric as an academic 
is actually to create impact in the world. So if people go, I really like that idea, get in touch, let's talk about it, let's help you achieve it. Because I'm an academic, I'm not going to be necessarily building the business. So it's, it's, it's up to people in the world to do that. I can just share ideas and help them achieve that and make the world a better place. And that's, that's gotta be what we're about. Completely, and I, I love that. And definitely, I think we'll put the links to your departments, to all the different platforms, or you are quite as well visible on Twitter and a lot of different platforms. I appreciate uh, your time. It's been a fantastic uh, journey. And definitely, I want much more, but I'll leave that for a second one. Thank you so much. <laughs>